Praise God. Let's, we're going to go on in today to Revelation chapter 8, as you all very well know. We have some, thank y'all so much for being faithful to Sunday school. Amen. Because we, we have some really some faithful yes, we do. Uh, parishioners, I guess you say. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It's good to have you. It's good to always see your familiar faces come, and you're always excited to learn. So thank you for, for just Amen. continuing. Amen. Uh, but we, as you very well know, we're going through the book of Revelation. And, it, of course, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're learning as we go. And we're one thing that we, I hope we're learning, that Revelation is not as complicated as what people have believed or tried to make it that way, maybe, on purpose or maybe not on purpose, I don't know, but it's not as complicated as we first thought. Right. I think most of us could agree with that. To literally take the scripture and take it in a literal sense, not always having to spiritualize every Every single verse, every single half. I realize there are some things there, but if we always take the literal approach of applying the word in a literal sense, then we can take it and receive it and be blessed as the, the script, as the book started out, that he says that we are blessed if we will read this book. That's right and understand this book and we can enjoy that blessing in this day and time that we're living in it it brings peace it brings comfort it brings an understanding even in the events that we see happening in the world today because we are in a critical time we're in a time that that these things that we are studying are of course things have not yet come to pass but the things that we do see coming to pass before our very eyes are simply setting the stage and bringing us to the place that we're learning about the things that soon shall be. Right. So let's, let's just continue to take that approach and look into it this morning. Now we're going to look in chapter 8 and... Ironically, I, I had taught chapter 6, which began speaking of the seven seals. And we went through that, but chapter 8 is talking about the last seal, the seventh seal that the Lamb, the only one who was worthy, to take the book and open the seals thereof. So we're on the seventh seal. Beginning in verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, who's the one doing the opening? Jesus. Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God. <clears throat> there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, every other time that a seal was opened, there was some kind of noise. I know beginning in the, when the first seal was opened, there was a noise of thunder that was heard. And then one of the four beasts would come and say, come and see. But here we have in the seventh seal, there was a time of silence. Now, y'all have heard it said many times from this pulpit that heaven is a noisy place. But I, I, I don't... I didn't really understand why, at first, the scripture pointed out that there was a silence throughout all of heaven for about 30 minutes. There was greater, I think, greater the impact of judgment that was yet to come is going to be greater on the earth. And the inhabitants of heaven, the all that was there, maybe was just anticipating to see these events unfold. So I don't really know, but let's just take it for what it says. There was a time of silence there. And I saw, verse number two, the seven angels 
which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Doesn't particularly say who these seven angels were, but there is reference to Gabriel. And I don't remember the, the book and the chapter, but he made an announcement. I think it was whenever he came before Zacharias at the announcement of John's birth he was going to be born to he and his wife. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. But he said that I am Gabriel who stands before the presence of God. So we know that possibly Gabriel could be one of these angels. Don't know. Just saying. Scripture bears that out. Like I said, I, I, I didn't write the book and chapter down, but I'm pretty sure that's... But anyway, it says these are seven angels that are in God's presence. And that's what they are there. They are there. And it, it does give a... Uh, an insight, maybe the angels that are higher in authority, uh, that have a specific designated place of authority there before God's presence. And they were given seven trumpets. These seven trumpets that we're going to look into, I think, the first four in this chapter. We're going to read through the first four trumpets sounding. Now, do not confuse the trumpets with the seals. They're, they're not the same thing. The, the seals have been opened now as we're studying. The seventh seal has just been opened. And now we're getting into what the trumpet judgments will bring forth. The, seal, the seals that were, that were broke and opened, there were beginning of judgments that, that was given, fell upon the earth. And then later on, we'll, we will see seven vials that will be poured out. So all these, don't, don't confuse one with the other. They are individual. They're, they're to be understood in an individual way, so I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But <clears throat> it says in verse 3, now there is a distinction made here. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, and another angel, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now this, of course, doesn't tell us the identity of this angel. So we really can't make any speculation. But I want, I want us to look and see and focus upon the act that this angel did this morning and what, it, what significance it would bear out, what we could, could grasp and glean from what is being said. As we look into this and see that as the, as the angel came and stood before the altar, there was given unto him much incense. You know, I just kind of pondered that word much. Much is not little. But it speaks of great volume. It speaks of magnitude of some degree. It speaks of a definite huge proportion perhaps. The word much. We don't think much. We don't think much about the word much, do we? But much, that word much 
is used here with the, the measure, if you will, that is given of incense. Now, what is this a type of? I've, I found that through studying this and looking into it, that not just the word incense being mentioned, but much incense is a type. It is, it looks back, it, it points to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And I want us to go and, and look at this in a little bit closer detail in the book of Hebrews very quickly to see the, the place and the, uh, the work that he had done there and what it, what it done for us, how God received it. Now you could go back and study and you take time to study in the book of Exodus how that the priest would go and, and, and do this same duty of the incense that would be brought forth. I'm not going to take you there for time's sake this morning. Now, go with me to the seventh chapter of Hebrews. And I just want to briefly look beginning in verse 25, 24. Verse 24, chapter 7, it says... But this man, because he continues forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. I'm going to stop right there in just a minute. You see, when we take, first of all, I think this, this verse that we read of, uh, in Revelation 8 and 3, it reminds us of how important our prayers are before God. We could use the word precious in his sight. And it would be an understatement. But our prayers, church, I wished I had, I wished I had learned this years ago of how important our prayers are before God. I really do. I, I really think it would have helped me pray more. Do I pray enough now? No. But I'm not in, I'm not bound in that. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm growing in that. I'm living in that. I'm experiencing that as I grow. So I'm thankful that I have it now and an understanding instead of, you know, many years on down the road. But the, the much incense, I believe, points us in the right direction of understanding the message of the cross, all that Jesus afforded and paid there for us. But it was a man. He had to come. He was a man and he done these things. He was a man and he lived a perfect life. He was a man and he kept the law completely. He was a man and he surrendered to the will of the Father. He was a man when he walked up that hill, Calvary's cross. He was a man there before that when they tore him to shreds and beat him and, his, and the blood ran from his body. He was a man. And that's how we have to receive him there. We have to know that he was a man. They didn't do these things just because he, being the only begotten son of God, but as a man. As a man. I want that to sink in this morning. That's what he says. But this man, because he continues forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. We have to come to God by the sacrifice of Jesus to receive him right. as that man right. that died and lives forever today. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered 
of himself. So that's what I want us to reflect on this morning. Everything we have as it concerns our relationship with God the Father must come through the sacrifice of his son. That's right. Everything. Everything. So when this angel presents this, has this golden censer, and it's containing this incense, and how they would do that, they would take it, they would put, take a coal from the brazen altar and put it in that incense, put it in that censer, and then that smoke would ascend before God. So here we see a picture of this that's going to take place in heaven. And with, he says, oh, let, me, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Got another place there I want to read. Hebrews chapter 10. And looking in verse number, let's see, I think it's verse number 12. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hallelujah. Now this, this of course is a, this is, tells us the work that took place there. This is what happened. This is as Jesus becoming our eternal high priest by one sacrifice and only one, only one time, right. as only once. Praise God. Praise God. Let's move on for time's sake and looking into the fourth chapter, I mean the fourth verse of the eighth chapter of Revelation. He says, in the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand <clears throat> you know I don't I, I can't explain all of this but I see no other no other reason than to look at this as it represents the prayers of all saints of all time That's right. That's right. coming up before God Eternal. It's, it's they'll never be lost. Think about it. And it's mixed with that incense as it comes forth of that golden censer. It's mixed with his his perfect sacrifice. It's, it's mixed with his precious blood that, that paid that price. That's see that's that's part of the blessing that we get by receiving and believing and following the gospel message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's right. And understanding that as we pray. Understanding that, that it's, it's in him. Yeah. It's all because of him. That he was a man that done this. And he done it, surrendered to his father. Thank you, Lord, for making a way for us. But this, everything about him, everything about his work, because he lived, he done this, he done all this, was of no consequence without the death on the cross. That was the, when he said it's finished. It is done. He finished the work. Now let's... Let's continue reading. It says in verse 5, he said, The angel took the scepter and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. You know, it's, 
it's probably going to be said again and it's been said before. <clears throat> Anywhere on the earth is not going to be a good place to be during this time. Amen. But most of this is going to take place in the country surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. In the, the old Roman Empire, the, the ten king, the kingdoms back, all the ancient kingdoms it's in that area of, of the world. Doesn't mean that it's not going to happen in other places. But most of it's going to be focused there. And as we'll keep reading, I think it'll, it'll make more, uh, you'll begin to see that more. But literal hell and fire raining upon the earth mingled with blood. It somehow points back to some of the plagues that took place during Egypt whenever the children of Israel, Israel was still in bondage and Pharaoh wouldn't turn them loose. So there was plagues that were sent. So this, this, this was a, a reminder that God was able to do it then He's able to do it in the future. And we have no reason to believe that it's not a literal hail and fire and blood that will come. The second angel, verse number eight, sounded and as it was a, it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood. Now some of the, the, the scholars that I studied behind and looked in saying that it's, it is talking about the Mediterranean Sea. That this, this meteorite is, is going to be sent and fall into the sea. And a third part of that sea is going to become blood. Now I don't know, I didn't take time to study how big the Mediterranean Sea is, but it is it's pretty good sized body of water. It's, it's very large. So to think about this, this is going to be uh, something that's going to be on the news all across the world. They're going to wonder what is going on. They're going to see this, this phenomenon that has happened. They're going to figure out probably some kind of way to explain it. You know, as, as people usually try to do and convince people that they are in control of everything. But God is the one who is in control. Amen. Verse number nine, it says that the third part of the creatures were, were in the sea and, and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. So a third part of the living creatures floated to the top and was dead. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a sight that is going to literally take place. The, the ships that were there, a third part of them was going to be destroyed. So, you know, think about it. There, there could be, even now, as ships and preparing for war and things like that, of that nature, it could be a lot yes. of the ships of the world being there. That's right. right. From all countries. Right. So think about it. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be quite an impact. Yeah. Verse number 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. You know, he's the same God that took bitter waters in Exodus chapter 15 and made them sweet. But is now bringing the judgment upon the rivers of water. It says it was a third part of all the rivers of water and upon the fountains of waters. So we're, we're talking about a judgment that's coming upon the, the, the water supply for the world. That, that is required for life. Mm -hmm. that's right. it's, it's something that's going to take place because this, this star, this meteorite, if you will, is going to hit 
And it's going to affect this a third part of the waters. You know, there's rivers of water that run above the ground. Yeah. And there's rivers of water under the ground. That's right. That cover miles and miles and miles mm -hmm. that people draw their water supply from. So it's very easily to, to see that this can happen. Right. And it's going to happen. But this this word this this name wormwood is a is I think it's actually a plant that is mentioned, and it's uh, it's a very very bitter, very bitter. It's like the most bitterest thing known to man. It's poison, and it's literally going to poison the water supply. You know that's. That's one, that's one of the biggest things we see sometimes when a natural disaster takes place is getting water in. That's right. Trying to get water here for people and things like that. It says many men died right. because the waters were made bitter. Mm -hmm. But aren't you glad that in saying this, that he's the same God today yeah. that could take your bitter waters and make them sweet? Amen. The same way that he showed Moses when Moses cried unto the Lord, and he says he showed him a tree. And he took and he cast it into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. He showed us a tree. And he has showed us a tree. Yes, that is so right. And as we keep looking unto him and to that tree that he, he gave his life on, Amen. the finished work. Yes. And it's not in that literal beam. It's not in that literal piece of wood. That's right. But it's in the work that was accomplished there. Yeah, that's right. And we have that for eternity to look at. It's, it's never going to go away. It's always going to be there. That work is eternal. Mm -hmm. He done it once and for all. Yes. And it's always going to be a part of the plan of God. It's, it's not just something that, that took place and will never be mentioned again. No, we live by it. We look unto it. We plan for it. Everything about us should point unto him yes, and yes. to that sacrifice. Yes. So that's, of course, we're, we're not going to be here during this time. That's right. Praise God. Praise God. And those who are here, hopefully, they will remember. They will begin to look. And we see evidence of that as we study this, this book of Revelation out. Verse number 12. And the fourth angel sounded. I'm sorry, I don't read. No, I'm sorry, I, I, I hadn't read that. It says the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. Third part of the moon. The third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Now we could read through this and not really realize the impact. But if you take right now, and everything gets altered by a third, it becomes darkened by a third. The sun, a third part of the sun, now you have the span of daylight that is a third less. One way to look at it. I think that's how we should look at it. It's cold. Yeah, it's cold. There's gonna, it's gonna impact the earth in some very violent ways. Yes. It's, it's, it's the, the entire earth mm -hmm. yes. is gonna impact. Yes, because it mentions the moon as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the way that the moon has upon the, even the, the oceans and the seas and the tide, right. how all that's regulated. God has it all in perfect timing, mm -hmm. all in complete control. Yep. A third part of it's going to be darkened. It's going to be, it's, it's not going to work. A third of it's not going to work. Yep. That's right. Even the, the light from the stars. A third of that is going to be smitten. So when you go out and you look in the star, when you get a clear night and you see that 
there is some light from the stars. When there's, when there's no moon, when there's no other light, and you're around no other lights, there is some light that comes from these stars. It's going to be a third less. And all this is going to have an impact upon planet Earth. Let's go real quick over to Luke chapter 21 and look at the very words of our Lord beginning in verse number 25. Luke 21, verse number 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring he's he's warning he's given a description of chaos mm -hmm. upon this planet right that's right next verse Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. These things are going to come to pass. And then after that, we're going to see what he says in verse 27. And then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with the power and great glory. This is, of course, after all of these things. After we're, you know, we're we're just getting started in, in studying on all these things that's going to happen. But when all these judgments have come, when all the wrath of God has been poured out, the Son of Man is coming. That's right. He's coming back. Yes. He's coming back to earth to rule and reign. And praise God, aren't you just excited and glad to know that you're serving him today? Amen. That you have something solid and real. Amen. And it's just, it's not some fairy tale. Amen. This is real. This is real. This is real. I, don't, I can't stress that enough. Amen. And he even, he even put it there, and we have it there recorded as what he said. This is going to take place. And the last verse, verse number 13, Revelation chapter 8. This is John. He says, And I beheld and heard an angel fly through the midst of heaven, <clears throat> saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of these of the three angels which are yet to sound. So in this last verse of scripture, there's going to be an angel, and we have no, no reason not to believe that this angel will be seen and heard, but he's going to fly through the heavens with a loud voice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Woe, woe, woe. There's three more woes coming as these last three trumpets are sounded. Is what he's telling the inhabitants right. of planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I wondered why why the word inhabitants? It's not the same word as inhabitant. It's not the same meaning. Those inhabitants are those who have fully given themselves to this world. They are drunken on this world. They are, they, they think that this world is all that they have. This is their home. I'm here to tell you today, this ain't my home. I'm an inhabitant right now on planet Earth, because I'm here, obviously. <laughs> but this word inhabitor was used. It's, it's not the same meaning. So he's pronouncing this woe for those that are still on planet Earth because they have chosen, they have made this Earth their home. 
This is all they've got. And you know, everything that we see that affects us, whether we realize it or not on a daily basis, the things that we, we, we come in contact with, television, media, things that we see, it all points and it all drives to you, the individual, of making this place your home. Right. You know, I just, I just pondered on that a little while. It's, it's all about this place. Even as we look into the methods of something as simple and as common as a builder, we have a contractor here among us. Things are built to be more permanent today than they were 100 years ago. That's, of course, that's a good thing. That's a good thing to have a home that's built to be more permanent because it takes less upkeep. It takes less energy. To, to keep it comfortable. All these things are good. But never sell out to the idea that this is your home. That because you can now have a better home and a, the house that you used to have and now that it's better that this is my home. No, it's not. Right. It's not your home. Amen. One day it's going to be somebody else's. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That's right. Hallelujah. And it's not yours. Amen. If you've made your calling in election, sure. You know the old song they used to sing? That this world is not my home. And y'all know it. What are we doing? We're just passing through. My treasures are laid up. Out there in heaven beyond the blue. Even as the angels today beckon me from heaven's open door, I can't build a home in this world anymore. So this world is not our home. And, and if people will just get that message today to stop focusing on things to, that, 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 that are here. Amen. I mean, I find it, the Holy Spirit reminds me quite regular of just things that I do. Everyday things and things that I try to, even on my job and things that we work on. And we try to make them better so you don't have to go back and you, you're continually fixing the same problem. That's not good. You want to fix that problem so you don't keep working on that same problem. Now, that may be another problem. But you try to make it better, you see. You try to make it better. When you build a new piece of equipment or you put another piece, piece of equipment in and the things that we do, you want to make it better. You want to make it more productive. You want to make it to where you don't, you're not there spending time on that. You're doing something else. But it's not... Permanent. It's not permanent. Amen. It's temporary. It's temporary. Everything that we do as pertaining in the natural here mm -hmm. is temporary. Amen. I mean, you can get out there and something that's simple. If you want to put you up a shed, whether you want to just get in the shade or get in the dry, one of the either both are good. And you can use a tarp, okay? And get you by for a couple of months. Or you can get out there and you can build something out of solid steel and get you by for many, many years. Or you can get out there with brick and mortar and concrete and steel and the best materials known to man and build it and it'd be good for centuries. But it's not permanent. Right. It's only temporary. Amen. So take that thought with you today. And know that your walk with Jesus Christ, your faith in him, in his finished work, that's what we build upon. Amen. Right. And I'm reminded when he taught of the two men who, who built their houses. The one that he said... If any man will hear these words of mine and do them, these sayings of mine and do them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon the rock. I want to be one of those that builds my house upon the rock. 
And that's not my earth dwelling place, but that's where I, that's my, that's my home. That's, that's where I, I'm at. I mean, that's, that's where I'm going to be. Then he said, if any man hear these sayings of mine and do them not, I will liken him unto a foolish man. And he built his house upon the sand. They both, in the natural, they both were houses. Both looked the same, but they had the difference was in the foundation. Okay, he, he, he had a home for a little while there, didn't he? But the storms came. The waters began to rise. The wind began to blow. And the fall of that house was great, he said. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So as you see and you as you grow and as you experience this life and you're seeing that things just don't matter as much anymore, you know, about making, you know, just, just trying to make sure everything is just perfect. It's, it's not going to be perfect. That's right. It's not going to be perfect. His sacrifice is always perfect. He is perfect. And he's making us perfect. Amen. Praise God. Thank y'all for Amen. your attention. And I hope today that just through reading this, you got something that'll help you. Absolutely. And bless you. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Thank you.